Hello, everyone. Welcome to Awkward Devs number 121. Um, I have a couple things to discuss today. Most of them are related to the merge. Um, two big things there. So uh, Mikhail uh, put together a document a week or two ago about uh, the consensus API for the beacon chain and the execution layer to communicate after the merge. Uh, we discussed this in a merge call and then ran way out of time. So uh, we can kind of continue that discussion here. And then a bit later in the call, uh, Felix uh, from the Get team put together a, a spec for basically what a post merge sync uh, algorithm could look like. Uh, so that's the other big thing we'll need to discuss there. Um, and then a bunch of other, uh, other topics. Um, but yeah, Mikael, uh, do you want to start maybe just like give a quick like one or two minutes you know, context about the document and then we can kind of resume uh, where we left off last time. Um, okay, thanks Tim. Uh, thanks for allocating the time for this discussion during the SCB. Um, yeah, a bit of the context. Uh, we've been, uh, obviously there will be like two uh, counterparties parties in the um, like client software uh, after the merge, which are the consensus client part and the execution client part. And we need the communication protocol between them in order to communicate uh, with blocks and uh, other stuff. Um, and we have something already, which been designed for the Iranis hackathon project. Um, and it's been based on the JSON RPC, but we might want to in, uh, extend this protocol add some other stuff and other restrictions to the um, underlying communication protocol. So there is a doc dropping it to the chat uh, that just the um, shapes and outlines the design space for this um, engine API. So it is the, or, uh, in the link there is a consensus API. So I just haven't changed the link, but we do this renaming from consensus API to the engine API. Um, and yeah, we, we started to discuss uh, these documents and stopped like um, not far from the beginning. So I'm going to share my screen uh, to continue the discussion from the um, from the point we have stopped at. Uh, and also, I've made some adjustments to this document and updated it with the, uh, the result of discussion we previously had. So I'm sharing my screen. Um, uh, yeah. You are not. Uh, no, 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 you're I, not sure. I, okay. I, yes, yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Yes. I'm sorry. Is it the right place? Okay. Yep. Anyway, this is perfect. Uh, well, it's on the agenda. Ah, okay. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. This is the agenda. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. This okay. one is, is the document, right? Yeah. You see it? Okay, cool. So um, I would encourage us not to fall into deep discussions right now. And if any item uh, that we are discussing uh, requires like to have like a more deep um, conversation on it, um, let's continue. Let's just mark it as the like requires some further discussions and continue offline on Discord or make uh, like other kind of call. Um, so uh, not to spend much time on every on everything. Um, yep. So let me turn on the chat and participants. Okay. Um, yeah. So I was starting from from the above. Um, uh, we'll go through the comments a bit. Uh, here is the comment from Yatsuk that uh, we should consider REST uh, for this kind of API. Um, I a bit. I'm a bit unsure about the rest, and I think that it will not see you as well for this API, uh, but we are still in the um, designing um, stage. So the things might have might uh, be changed. Uh, a couple of uh, things that will that rest uh, might not work well with is the bidirectionality of the protocol. Uh, there is a couple of use cases that might uh, need this protocol to be bidirectional, which means the execution client may initiate some um, message run trip. Uh, the other thing is that REST is uh, related, like is about the uh, resources, which are some entities. So I'm not sure if uh, this uh, fits uh, our, uh, this protocol as well. So, but yeah, Yatsuk, if, if you hear us, uh, just if you want to discuss this, let's discuss it on Discord more. 
Oh, real quick, there are uh, usually the counter to that is server side events, um, which can facilitate that with RESTful HTTP. But um, I'm not, I'm just putting that out there. I don't really want to discuss it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, uh, okay, so um, on the previous call, uh, we have decided to um, like to replace the assemble payload with a couple of related methods. Uh, uh, they are here now. So there is the prepare payload, which gives a comment to the execution client to stop building the, um, the payload. Uh, it has these parameters um, here, and uh, it will keep it up to date uh, until the get payload is called. Yes. Um, and, uh, this, uh, and this process of uh, producing the payload stops then, and the, pay and the most uh, updated and the most up-to-date payload is returned back to the consensus client, and then it, will, it can take and embed into the beacon block and fire uh, this block into the network. Um, yeah, there is a note that if the prepare payload uh, is called, uh, if, the, uh, if the prepare payload with another set of arguments of parameters is called after uh, the first one, then the process of building should be restarted with this new parameter set. Uh, which makes sense uh, as we can, like as the consensus client may receive a new block and it may become the head of the chain and it might want to restart its process uh, because it will build on the other uh, block. It will build its block on the other one. Um, get payload uh, have the same set of, uh, of uh, parameters here. Um, it could be argued that it should not uh, be so, but uh, the reason why they are here is the um, uh, first of all it, it can be used without the prepare payload this way so it can work as the assemble payload i don't know if there are any use cases for uh, this um, for this um, like property but the other stuff which i think more important is the additional consistency check uh, because the this like new block um, may be received by the consensus client and uh, the prepare payload might be sent be before the get payload uh, with the same parameters or processed like, yeah, there could be a kind of racing between these two messages. This is a very core edge case, uh, very much an edge case, but it could pot potentially um, be the case. So this is why here is the uh, set of uh, parameters as well. And if the, um, if it's not, it does not match to the to what was sent with prepare payload. Um, the block should be uh, either adjusted if it's even possible, or uh, created a new one with this uh, set of parameters and returned back to the consensus client. Uh, and this is to avoid uh, the weird case when the consensus client proposes a block with a payload that does not relate to this block. Um, what do you think about this like additional consistency check? I think that makes sense. I think it also leaves optionality for a client to not support prepare payload and just do on-demand gets, which you know probably is not an optimal strategy, but is uh, probably a reasonable thing to leave in there. So to have the full information makes sense to me. Okay. Any other opinions on that? What would be, for example, uh, there would be change in the parameters. What is the expected time that the get payload would return this new unexpected previous block? Um, this is a good question. So the default behavior might be just get all the transactions from the mempool. It will require some time to execute them and build a block as, as usual in the usual way. and return it back as fast as it's possible. Yeah, I mean, and that might end up being a little bit of implementation specific on how to handle that strategy. I don't know if it needs to make it into the uh, actual protocol definition. I do worry a little bit about- You could also just um, return nothing and say, nope, sorry, I can't do that. I, I do feel like there needs to be some kind of expectation set, even if they're not like part of the protocol, just in general. Uh, because if you say get payload without a prepare, the 
node starts building a block and they can stop adding transactions at any time. And so if there's a bunch of transactions in the mempool that are, for example, attack transactions that are consuming a lot of time, the execution engine could at some point have a timeout and say, okay, stop trying to build a new, stop trying to add transactions, cut it off here, send the block because we're running out of time. If you don't have any kind of sen sense of how long is acceptable, then presumably the execution client is going to just do whatever it normally does to get a sure. block, which maybe means hitting a remote server, maybe means just building until the block is full. And these things can take, you know, seconds, tens, tens well, of seconds. It also might be pathological scenarios. What, what is be able to return most quickly, which is empty. Yeah, and what Micah is saying uh, yes. is also related to the prepared payload. So it should be related. If we are adding this kind of protection to the uh, protocol. Right. Like with the prepare payload, at least you've got like this idea that if I get a prepare payload and I start preparing and then I get a get, I stop whatever I'm doing and I give them the best I've got, like yeah. as soon as possible, instantly. If that yes, means all I've got is an empty block, then I can send that right away. Whereas if you, all you get is the get payload, then either you default to sending only the empty block because you have no time to prepare anything, or you decide that I'm going to spend some amount of time actually build, acquiring a block. And there needs to be like you know some limit on that, presumably. Like you don't want two minutes, for example. That's obviously wrong. Um, is 10 seconds too long? Is five seconds, two seconds? Yeah, as I understood, you were like saying about malicious transactions in the man pool that could take a lot of time to execute and in this case we might want to add the this time restriction to the prepare payload as well because prepare payload has uh, much more time in advance right and it could include all those transactions uh, without any problem this is so, what i was mentioning mike are you suggesting that there should be a a note about a, a, an expected return time and that's not necessary that makes it into the spec um, I don't even know if it needs to make into the spec. I just think that we should give execution client devs enough information to like, maybe they, di they differ a little bit, but like, presumably the consensus clients will have a timeout on their end. Yeah. And we should, so maybe, I mean, execution yeah. I, know in that it. sense, I think you could, but no, this is expected to return, you know, a viable block within 500 milliseconds or something maximum. But that is not, that ends up being right. like, yeah, which is reasonable. Which is it doesn't um, have to. Yeah, be. and I think that would be. I'd be totally fine with that if it was in this. Again, I'm totally fine if it's also just like something that we just generally share amongst each other. I just want to make sure that it doesn't get left out and forgotten. Is all. Um, yeah, I, I do see value in doing this, uh, but if we want to discuss more on that, let's continue on the Discord. What do you think? Yeah, I'm cool. always happy let's to discuss on Discord. Down. Cool. Okay, so so let's move on. Um, yeah, and execute payload. Um, so it verifies the payload um, according to the execution environment rule set, which is exposed in the IP. Um, here is the question from Martin. What if the parent block state is missing? Should some error type for that be defined? Um, this document uh, like has a section of the consistency checks, of the consistency checkpoints. Uh, which uh, answers this question. So once we get there, we can discuss it. Uh, I... But the basic, uh, but the basic idea is that if you execute payload, send something that can't be processed because can be processed by the execution, the execution client because of absence, uh, because some information is absent. So the execution client responds with the corresponding message that something is wrong. Uh, and uh, yeah, can be consensus and execution client starts the recovery process. Uh, this is one of the option, options or the execution client goes to the network, um, goes to the wire and pulls of all this data. This is the default. And Danny? Oh, I was gonna say, um, and this is getting ahead of ourselves, but I think in a, in a, in a sync protocol, it is going to make sense for the beacon chain to be um, optimistically processing forward without execution validation. And I think that likely it's most simple to handle most of, most optionality of the sync protocol underneath for it to continue to run execute payload and just continue to send the messages to the, uh, the execution layer. And in that sense, I think there might be value in having an enum that's like 
valid and valid known and maybe syncing or processing such that it knows that it hasn't been fully validated, but it kind of continues on optimistically. But that, I don't think we can make that decision without talking about a lot more sync. So we can leave that. Right, this uh, doc, uh, this like doc has a suggestion on the like sync status return instead. So yeah, it's uh, it's optional. So it, it, it also covered here, but it depends on the sync uh, entirely. So okay. um, yeah, uh, the consensus validated message, which is mapped on the proof state consensus validated event from the EIP, um, it's easy. Um, it's sent to the execution yeah, client um, by the consensus client when the uh, when the beacon block um, gets validated with respect to the beacon chain um, state transition, or like the AP says with respect to the consensus rule set. So this is required um, before the block can be persisted by the execution client, even if the execute payload returns, even if the payload is valid uh, with respect to the execution environment rule set. Yeah, here it's is the- like if uh, you were processing a block and you hadn't checked the proof of work, but you had done all the processing of the block otherwise, and then someone said, hey, the proof of work's valid as well. Right. Right. Yeah, thanks, Danny, for this um, comparison. So here is the block processing flow. You can check how these messages could be sent. Like there are two options. So the consensus validated may be sent like while the payload is being processed or after that. Um, so this opens up uh, like, yeah, the alternative would be to send execute payload after the beacon block has been imported, which will cause uh, a delay required to um, process the beacon block and uh, uh, like sep keeping these two messages separate opens up the uh, ability to parallelize the beacon block and the execution payload processing, which is nice. Um, the next one is the, any questions here? Any questions so far? Um, if a consensus validated message is sent, without an execution payload, or sorry, execute payload being run, would that then run the execute payload or not? Uh, you mean that if it's sent before the corresponding I, execute like if, payload? If a client right? just bypasses execute payload and just runs consensus validated, would that uh, just trigger execute payload plus consensus validated and return it back valid? Um, if you have, yeah, if, if it's this message is received, but the payload is unknown, is this the case you are asking for? Yeah, yeah, the execute payload has not okay. been called. This is validated, yeah. it is called um, on that yes. block. That'd be a trigger to kind of like run all the processing. And we can just note that as like a weird edge case to think about. Um, right, right, but it could be cached like for a short time like consensus validated stuff yeah. in the memory okay. and wait for the payload. Yeah, this there is a like a cache section, like um, here is execution payload cache. It uh, touched this uh, question a bit, a little bit. So the you order of this is that. So you yep. could say invalid, you could cache it, or you could say, hey, this thing's telling me it's been validated. I should process, I should process it. But I guess- oh. Yeah. yeah if it's invalid, then you, yeah. Yeah. Right. So there are. We can take this one now. Uh, option two. Okay. Um, yeah. Check in the chat. Okay. Cool. Engine fork choice updated. Um, there is the PR to the, to the EIP. I'll drop it into the chat. Uh, that unifies the two previous events, which was the chain had set and the block finalized into the one. So uh, this document is uh, uh, matched the follows the EIP currently or vice versa. Anyway, um, here is the suggestion from the previous call and comment from Micah confer 
I, I've called it concurrent block hash, which means that this block is concurrent by two thirds of the uh, testers in the network. Uh, they have been they have voted for it. Uh, this is for JSON RPC uh, for users JSON RPC um, actually. Uh, here is like a bunch of stuff. So this, yeah, there is a head block hash and finalized block hash, which must be, and the confirmed block hash, all this information must be updated. Uh, all the changes related to this uh, method call must be applied uh, atomically to the block store. So the, in order to avoid where yeah. cases when the head block, even for microseconds points to the, uh, to another fork than the finalized block hash and the confirmed block hash as well. So um, there is one, uh, out of this unification, there is one note here. This is more for consensus client developers. Um, in the EIP, um, uh, this event should, the finalized block hash before the transition, uh, before uh, the first finalized block hash, um, it should be stopped with uh, all zeros. So this event will be sent, will send, will be sent in the um, actual head block hash, but the finalized block hash will, will be stopped with uh, all zeros before we get the first finalized block hash actually in the system. But there is nothing like uh, no additional work required to do this kind of stub because after the merge work, we have uh, we will have the execution payload in the block, uh, which filled with all zeros. So the finalized block hash, um, we, we will have this uh, block hash already stopped with zeros. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I could be a bit messy, but you can read this and yeah, it should be enough to um, to understand what I've just talked about. Um, yes. so, yeah, uh, this was my first try on the introducing the concurrent block hash stuff. So it's just sent for each each, each block the state status um, can, uh, invalid and concurrent okay. concurrent, uh, which is redundant. We... And uh, I yep. Um, just, I was wondering why is, so the engine consensus validated versus engine for choice updated? Um, what information do you get? Like, why are those two separate? Like it feels, it, I'm guessing I'm just missing something, but it feels like they're sending the same information. You can get blocks no, that are actually. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Danny. Oh, just, um, the, the consensus validated means like I checked the proposer signature, I checked the attestations and the other like kind of outer consensus components of something I previously had you execute and check on the execution layer and that you can put it into your block tree. Updating the fork choice has is independent of the fact that a block was valid to insert in your block tree. And a block that I insert into your block tree may or may not ever be the head or in the canonical chain. Right, it's just so from a different consensus fork. Validated, consensus validated will happen before it, the block makes it into the head head block in the normal case? Yes, yes. It's kind of I like all um, just, this outer consensus stuff the execution layer can't validate, and it's the confirmation that all of that stuff was also valid. OK, so the execute, first consensus client will say, hey, here's a block. Please execute it. The, engine, the execution engine executes it, replies back, this is good. Since this client then does some additional checks and then says, hey, my extra checks are also good. And then some point later, it'll say, hey, this is now the head block. And then eventually this is a confirmed block and eventually this is a finalized block. Like that's the normal path of a block yeah. through the process. And is that correct? Process, a lot of that uh, can happen in parallel. So like checking the attestations and things like that. And then the final thing it's going to do is actually do the beacon state route, which includes the execution state route and stuff, and then passes it back along. So okay. if, if consensus validated no returns uh, that the consensus what, uh, was not valid, then we can just throw away the data that uh, throw away Correct. the block, right? Right. You must, uh, yeah, you must discard this block. Hey, guys. Uh, uh, I just, I was just quickly wondering, like, why is the fork choice, like, why is so much, like, why is the fork choice stuff communicated to the execution layer in so much detail? 
uh, I mean, I haven't really looked at this API, you know, ever and like seeing it now, it just feels kind of weird that, you know, like the execution layer should know like all of these details about the fork choice. Um, so the bare minimum. Um, like the, the idea, for example, is that the fork, the, the execution client knowing the finalized fork choice and the block hash is uh, really useful because uh, the execution client has like different tricks for storing state that basically optimize for making it like really easy to update, um, but at the cost of making it hard to revert. Um, and if you know what the final is. Hey, but that like you're super quiet. Like I can tell you're talking, but I can't hear a single word you're saying. Okay, hold on. Sorry about that. Um, am I less super quiet now? Okay. Um, yeah, basically I was just saying that for the finalized block hash in particular, the issue is that like the ex execution clients have a lot of optimizations where they yeah, basically trade off um, increased efficiency of reading and writing to the, to the yeah, um, state as it is now um, in exchange for making it harder to like go backwards and uh, revert and revert to previous states. Um, and so if you give the execution clients a, a finalized hash and you, so that it knows that it's not, never ever gonna have to revert past that point, then the execution clients can use that information to like basically like um, dump all the information, like dump the the, um, the uh, journal and like flush memory and do all sorts of things yeah, that make, right. makes more efficient. So I um, understand this part, but what I don't, I mean, I it's obviously it's kind of important to know if the block is finalized or not, but it, I don't really get why, for example, it should know that the block is confirmed because this information seems like, yeah. Partial, I mean, partial finalization information is still useful. Like it's a, it, it, it's a trade-off space, right? So, so I think we had a discussion about the API. The problem yeah. is if you only have the latest block, that is a, a very unreliable information and might, might be even less like confirmed than currently on proof of work. So we want most applications to follow a slightly less aggressive um, head, basically. That's why the confirmed is in there. So to be clear, yeah. You you want the head and you want finality and you want to update that information atomically. So those are really required. And then this notion of confirmed or safe is um, a definition which might help serving like Web three APIs on on head. Yeah, and here is optional in that sense, but is likely valuable. Here is the list the just proposed list uh, of the new statuses for um, the block and for the JSON RPC, new identifiers and JSON RPC for the block. So it could be finalized, it could be safe, which means it's confirmed, it could be unsafe, which is unconfirmed and pending. It's extended by safe, it's extended uh, with, with finalized and safe unsafe. And safe will be an alias to latest uh, according to this proposal. So latest will be uh, will always uh, point to the confirmed block, uh, I think and this is aligned with what we have currently in the proof of work chain because latest always uh, uh, like points to the uh, to the to a block that is uh, accepted by that that could be accepted by the network in terms of uh, the proof of work uh, verification, and uh, in terms of like consensus all consensus verifications. So this this okay. is like the same as in the proof of stake uh, with the like confirmed blocks with two thirds of testers voted for a block. Okay, right. I so understand like, it like, now. Yeah. I can so give you the head, but it's good to atomically update a couple of other pieces of information with the head. Yeah. Okay, I understand. So basically, the the plan is to treat this, you know, like confirmed block as the like head block like the way we treat the head block now, and then you know there may be additional blocks after that, but they are not like to be used really like i mean you can use but it's not a, not recommended right for the depending users. on your use case yeah right. yeah for, for your average for your average user latest meaning safe is kind of a very reasonable default behavior if you're using a d app or whatever yes. however if you're doing something like mev extraction or bot work or whatever then you probably almost certainly want unsafe um, but, but you also know what you're doing and you recognize that you're taking risks and you're building on, you intentionally want to build very specifically on the absolute latest block. And so that's why we return both because both have different use cases for end so users. Yep. Um, 
um, I'll remove this suggestion, but I will move this kind of stuff to to this method just to give more uh, context for the current block hash. Why is needed? Um, any other questions on the fork choice update? Um, just uh, on the sorry, I'm going back to that's validated again. Um, so it says block should be discarded. Uh, is there absolutely no situation where the execution portion of that block may come up again? Like, for example, could the next um, slot contain the same execution block? Uh, no, no, because we have this rendao stuff. Uh, we are going to have this uh, rendao uh, stuff. Uh, well, but if, does the rendao change if there's an empty slot? Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, no. 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 I guess, yeah, I guess so the timestamp would change. Like, right? it, it depends on which rendal we use. If for the current slot, then it makes uh, like. Yeah, I guess there's still the timestamp. Okay, yeah. so, yeah. so there's change. no way for that right, to change. Right. Yep. Good. Okay. Yeah, we have a timestamp here, actually, which matters. Okay. Um, should we move on? Yeah, and just as a heads up, we can probably do like another five or so minutes on this. I doubt we finish everything in the next five minutes. Um, yeah, just to move on to the Felix document as well after. Okay, cool. Um, so block processing flow is here to illustrate. Yeah, this couple of sequence diagrams. It just illustrates how the uh, block will be processed. I should probably add uh, the folk choice stuff here, the folk choice update stuff here. Clarity. I'll do that. Um, now we are going through the transition process, and which uh, this is a very critical part um, of this API. Um, and yeah, uh, all the transition stuff uh, and all the stuff that is marked as scope transition, including some parameters of some methods, will be deprecated after the merge and uh, could be removed uh, from the clients um, in the next like updates. Um, when the merge has already happened. So we have here um, like a couple of, uh, the, yeah, we have here the couple of uh, things uh, that will help for the case when we would like to um, override the terminal total difficulty or set the terminal of work block, which overrides the terminal total difficulty, overrides. Yeah, so um, uh, these two methods. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I believe terminal proof of work block override would need an epoch as well, uh, in which the effect goes in. Otherwise, everyone would fork at different epochs, do the merge at different um, epochs. The, the epoch matters for the consensus client, right? But what matters for the execution client is the, the block hash. Uh, right, because it's just going to be waiting for that block hash and then got it, got it. Right, and we, we should have the respective uh, parameters on the consensus client side because the consensus client uh, rules uh, manage this transition stuff. So if, uh, if there is like a kind of emergency and any of these parameters are communicated to like in some channel, um, in some public channel, uh, the clients should restart, should be restarted with either of this one. Um, and yeah, they will be communicated down to the execution client when they are set from on the consensus client side. Um, more on the reasoning behind this, uh, is uh, the reason issue here. Um, yep. Also, by the way, I forgot to mention that that this terminal total difficulty override will also be used uh, for uh, setting the terminal total difficulty in the normal case. So once the merge uh, fork happens, this terminal total difficulty gets computed by the consensus client and communicates it via this method to the execution client. So it will know uh, at which total difficulty it must stop processing the proof of work blocks. This is all specified in the EIP, this behavior. Yeah. Um, yeah. I feel I like we, 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 
yeah, yeah we should we should stop here and if we have any uh, time to answer the questions like we could do this yeah and i guess one thing that might be worth uh, discussing on the discord after is if we want another merge call next week to maybe finish this uh you know going through this like before the e2 call um right yeah we don't need to agree to this now but um yeah i think it's just worth uh seeing it's definitely something we can do um okay, so yeah i'm happy to stop me. here oh sorry danny go ahead i would say a call before the e2 call next week is totally fine I guess, yeah, maybe we can just figure that out now. Does anyone here feel like that would not be valuable? We might have some juicy sync API things to discuss after our people sit on sync for a week too, so. Right, right. So, okay, let's do that. Let's do a call before, um, before the E2 call next week uh, for an hour. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah, th thanks a lot, uh, Mikael, for sharing this. Um, and yeah, uh, let's let's keep the conversation on, on Discord in the next week. Uh, and yeah, uh, Felix, do you want to give us a quick rundown for your uh, document around the, the post merge sync? Uh, yeah, I can I can do this. Um, I was actually kind of hoping to be able to like share the document in the screen, but for some reason, I can't seem to do this in here. Uh, I don't know. OK, I, I, I should be able to share it. Uh, give me a sec. Yeah, so I'm really sorry about this. But for some reason, it's not. it doesn't always work. Um, anyway, um, yeah. But I while you dig it up, I can also just um, start talking. So how we probably going to do this is like basically I can just talk for a couple of minutes about the general idea behind this like sync stuff and like where we're coming from with this and then after this we can kind of discuss so I'll just tell you when you know you need to scroll sorry for this indirection but it's, I think it's going to be the easiest Sounds good. So, Sounds good. so basically yeah and uh, Pooja also linked the document so it's there um, yeah, so uh, maybe stop here. So we can quickly talk a little bit about the background of this. So uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, we had our team meeting. And in the team meeting, we uh, uh, I asked uh, Peter a little bit about like his ideas for the sync because he had been kind of busy uh, thinking about it and trying out some stuff, how it could be implemented and so on. And then, yeah, he told me about his ideas and uh, we made like some 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 drawings and kind of yeah just like basically try to get the like good picture of it and then uh, Peter basically went to on vacation and now basically I'm I'm right now the guy who's you know like basically carrying a torch forward and I suspect that he will come like when he's back he will likely take over and uh, keep working on this so um, this document that I just released yesterday uh, is basically only really concerned with the sync. So this is kind of important because when I uh, asked some people for a review, they, you know, immediately jumped out and were, you know, like, yeah, the, discussing like the API that is used in this document. And, you know, like if it matches the, the, the real API or that that is going to be used between the clients and stuff and it's not about this api it's really only about like you know very specific part of the sync which is exactly the sync that isn't processing non-finalized blocks so basically the main interest here is about the part where the client is you know trying to sync up finalized blocks and then for the beacon chain it's like you know it for it to, you know, like basically for the clients to be fully in sync with the network, obviously there, it has to get to the real head of the chain. And this, in the end of the sync, some uh, 
it will, you know, basically just perform the same operation that it would always perform if it's already synced, which is just, you know, like processing basically, you know, like very recent blocks. So it's not about this part. And it's also not really about like handling reorgs and things like that during this like later normal operation. But this is really only about this like earlier part where it doesn't have the full chain yet. And it's, you know, like just trying to basically get to a state where it can start processing blocks. So this is the main importance here. And then basically I wanted to quickly go over the definition. So basically we have, what you can see there is that I define three operations, which are basically calls that could, can be uh, made by the ETH2 client to the ETH1 client. And you will be, see these calls all over. And it might be a bit confusing for, especially for people who are very familiar with ETH2, because these calls don't directly match, you know, like the consensus engine API, and they also work a little bit differently from, you know, what, what you might expect. And it will be changed later. We already, I have the feedback and it will be changed. But for now we have the two most interesting calls, which are final and prog. <clears throat> and then the final is basically just for submitting a finalized block. And this is supposed to be called for all finalized block, not just, you know, like when finalization actually happens, but basically every block that is moves into the final state will have this called and then proc is for all the non-finalized blocks and these calls they are generally less important in the context of this document but the proc is still used somewhere so this is why it exists but it's mostly about this one call which is the final and i just want to make it really clear that it's not doesn't really match the semantics of the api right now so now we can go basically to the to the e2 section sorry p p b refers to a block or a block hash um, no, it's a it's a block. This is the 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 the, the uh, terms are actually defined right above this. So we have the. I but I it's probably a good idea to go through it quickly. So in this document we have lowercase b for beacon chain blocks and uppercase b for app, uh, for execution layer blocks. And uh, the b is always a complete ex execution layer block. And then we also have h, which is for block headers. So the block hashes actually never occur in this document. It's really only about like blocks and headers. So just keep it in mind. And then the 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 the, the like subscript there is basically just it identifies the block. So we can we can go to the uh, I guess we can go to the uh, ETH two section now. So in the from the ETH, I describe the sync in two ways. So there's ETH2's perspective and there's the ETH1 perspective, but they happen at the same time. And it's kind of important to, to keep this in mind as well. So basically when the idea here is pretty simple and you can see it by the picture as well. So in the, in the first step, when the ETH2 client starts, it starts, we assume here at the, at the weak subjectivity checkpoint. And you can see it, it's basically the block where it has the, uh, the, 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 the pink star, and uh, this one, it, it, it has a star because, you know, like the, the, this is like the initial, like it has the state of the beacon chain at this block. It's available and it's a verified state. So this is why it has this star. And basically the idea is it provides this block, actually only the header, uh, the execution layer header of this block, it provides to the client in the first step. And that's really it. There's, it doesn't really need to do anything else. And then the idea is that from this uh, weak subjectivity checkpoint block, it the beacon client moves forward through the beacon chain up to the latest finalized block and it just has to kind of assume that the chain is valid or basically it cannot really ver verify anything against the execution layer because the execution layer doesn't know anything yet so it just kind of has to process it optimistically by signatures or whatever and once it reaches the latest finalized block uh, this is the step number three now. It actually provides the execution layer block, which is embedded in this block to the ETH1 client. And uh, now we can go a bit further down and go to the next part. So now basically- I'm, I'm sorry, so, uh, Felix, I have a question. So the first yes. final final B call should be made uh, with the latest finalized block. Yeah, in this case. Yeah, yeah, you had the question in okay. your document, yeah. Um, basically, yeah, it's just an assumption for now, which it just makes it easier to explain the procedure. Yeah. Um, okay. And then basically, um, now, uh, since it, it has provided the final block, uh, it just keeps providing the like finalized blocks as they happen. So it keeps following the chain and it keeps providing the like finalized blocks and uh, to the ETH1 client. And then it has to do this, you know, while the ETH1 is syncing, which will take, you know, like a lot of time. <laughs> So basically the, our assumption here, it actually takes like T beacon blocks worth of time to synchronize and this can be quite long. 
And eventually, when the ETH1 is done, it will, it will basically respond to one of these final calls with the signal that it is synced to this particular block that was just provided. And once that's the case, we can basically go into the regular processing and start, you know, like uh, putting the, the, the non-finalized blocks through. So basically, after this point, when the ETH1 says that it's synced up to the latest finalized block, it is ready to process non-finalized blocks. And this is basically the end of the sync. So that's kind of it from the ETH2 point of view. And now we can go to the ETH1. Are there any questions at this point? Uh, I have one. Um, regarding this um, uh, payload execution after the sync is done, uh, when we get this yeah. message, uh, there are two options. Uh, one is uh, the execution client um, stores all the execution payloads and then then when the sync is done it just executes them on top of the pivot block the other option is that it communicates that the sync is done to the consensus client and consensus client replace these execution payloads in this case the um, execution client don't need to store them but yeah it, it, it should store them right uh, i mean in terms of so the way i see it in this document data. is that okay so I was assuming basically that uh, the execution layer is, so my assumption is very simple. Basically the execution layer shouldn't really store anything that is, you know, like totally unverified. And even the ETH2 client in this case, it cannot really verify these blocks because it cannot process them because there's no state to process them on. So I felt like basically it doesn't really make sense for the, even for the, for the consensus layer to you know like process or look at these blocks it can always look at them later you know like when it's kind of ready for it so th these blocks don't need to be stored in the execution layer before it has reached the finalized block because th th these blocks you know might be totally invalid and and they can be reorg at any time so it's kind of you know like why would it even care about these blocks in the first place it re should really mostly care about blocks that you know like have you know it can actually verify so this is why I didn't put it, you know, this option that during the sync, it will also start providing the like non-finalized blocks because you cannot do anything with these blocks during the sync. They are not processable. So yeah. just because I, it was finalized doesn't mean that it verified the state transitions either. So, well, that's, I, that's, and that's an, another question. So we will, right, we will but that get is to kind it of like operating in, in block headers and just looking at difficulty and making the trade off that, okay, when I get to the head, that was probably a reasonable head because so, everyone else agreed and that had a high, high enough difficulty. So following the beacon chain without execution is probably making a similar assumption. And I, So we are, we, we are assuming here that if the block was finalized by ETH2, there is a pretty high chance that it has a valid state transition because the ETH2 should not be finalizing, you know, invalid state transitions. Right, so right. This is why, yeah. the head with respect to attestation beyond finality is also you know there's a degraded amount of security but it's, it's uh yeah operating kind okay. of in the same in the same yeah yeah but this is this this would this is just too complicated for me right now so basically i don't really care about this detail sure. too too much for I, me it's i, like I care about the detail because i think that it simplifies things if the consensus just continues to provide the data normally like here Here's what's finalized. Here's what's processed. Here's what's finalized. Here's what's processed, and that the execution, no matter what their sync process is, when they're at the end, just transit ends up with a state that is akin to what the uh, yeah consensus. yeah we will get to the state. So I basically the way I want to do is basically I go through a document in the end we did, we we, we discuss. So basically um yeah so. It, the the ETH, the ETH one perspective is you know kind of you know like a mirror of what we just had. So basically, what happens is it gets the signal to start the sync. This is the step number one in the diagram by you know receiving the first call to the final. And previously, it has also received this checkpoint header. Uh, it's the it's the HW. And um, now the idea is basically that uh, very simply, it uh, starts downloading the historical headers in reverse, and it does it until it reaches the genesis block. And when it crosses the checkpoint, it also has, you know, a validation step where it actually checks that the, um, um, it also checks that uh, the, the downloaded headers match this checkpoint. And this is just a safety net to basically not land on like totally invalid chain. Otherwise we would have to go all the way to the, all the way back to the Genesis block to find out that it's the wrong chain. So that's why we have this like intermediate thing. We will obviously also verify the Genesis, but if it matches the weak subjectivity checkpoint, I think we're pretty safe. 
like would be kind of weird if that one's wrong. So, and then uh, when we're kind of done with the headers, we can actually download the uh, block bodies in the forward direction. So this is the step number three in the diagram. And by the way, the text for this is below the diagram. So just if you're look, trying to look at the text, this, the text that describes all this is actually below that. So, and then you go um, basically through the block bodies and here you have two options. You can either basically perform the full sync, in which case you simply process every block body uh, as you download it and incrementally recreate uh, the state. And then the other option is, of course, the state synchronization, where instead of processing it, you just download the blocks. And while you're doing it, you're also concurrently downloading the application state. And uh, we expect that, you know, because we're like in the get mindset, we expect it's probably going to be done with something like the snap sync. And um, so the idea is that uh, you will basically provide this. And then what's really important to understand is also in the diagram, um, while, um, this, while this like the steps two and three are happening, uh, we are actually getting notifications about newly finalized blocks. And these notifications need to be processed. And this is this how they are processed is described above the diagram. <laughs> Sorry for the order, but and basically it's the, the, the process is that if you receive a block that exactly matches the next block, then it's simply written to the database. And it can also be used, for example, to retarget the sync to a newer pivot block, which is something that is absolutely required for the snap sync. It's less required for, for example, the full sync, but it's it's really needed for the snap sync. So this is why it, it ha also ha it has implications on the on the on the sync. And then if there is any other uh, finalized block provided, then there are two options: either the block is you know a historical block, in which case it's kind of you know was provided for whatever reason, and in this sync model we don't care about it, so we just say it's old, and um, or invalid. And then if it's a future block then we restart the sync on this future block. And the idea for this, we will get to it later, is for the like restart handling of the sync. That basically like if the E2 client was restarted and now you know has reached a different finalized block, then we basically just restart the entire sync procedure on the E1 side and just uh, you know like try and basically do redo the missing steps. So now we can go uh, even further down. Oh, wait, wait, wait one second. So what you can see is that basically after all of this is done, uh, basically you can see that two blocks have state in this diagram. So one is the HG, which is the Genesis block. This, the state of this is always available. And the other one is this like block B plus F, uh, B, F plus T, which is basically the like final block of the sync. So when this block is reached, we have to guarantee that the complete application state is available. And this is why it has the green star in the diagram to show that this is, you know, the block with the you know final state. In the case of the full sync, we actually may have more state, and uh, we will get to the question of state at the very end. But basically, for now, what you can assume that after the sync, what is guaranteed is that this like the sync block has the state available. And this is kind of it for the ETH1 side because after that, it will simply receive you know uh, calls to to process non-finalized blocks. And these blocks can, you know, be processed on top of the state, which is available. And there may also be reorgs. And but this is really not the reorgs and the sync are like two different things for now. So it's kind of not really related. So we're done in this as well. Um, now we can quickly skip over the section which talks about the client restarts. I don't really want to go into it too much, but it, I think this is going to be very important for the uh, for the ETH1 client authors to consider these things. So basically um, here we mostly talk about like how to handle the content of the database when there are multiple sync cycles and how to efficiently reuse um, the information that was already stored in some previous sync. Uh, we have a couple things here. Uh, one is the handling of, you know, like when, when, when the chain that was previously stored is now like when, when you're syncing a, a, a different chain on top of one that was already synced, then you need to erase the old information and you can reuse the parts by way of this marker system, which is described in the second to last paragraph. So it explains there that basically, if we have previously uh, synced a, uh, an, an entire segment of finalized blocks, we can efficiently skip over this segment and not have to basically recheck every single one if we already have it or, you know, basically we can skip a lot of work this way. And I think this will be quite important to implement something like this, especially 
uh, when we change the sync later or when it you know becomes uh, for example like if it is restart like every time you restart the sync basically you need to figure out what to do with the stuff that's already in the database and it's good if it can be reused efficiently so now we can get to the to the last part which is the reorg processing and i think this is actually going to be the main subject of the discussion in the upcoming week or two weeks Basically, um, this scheme, what we assume here is basically that because the clients were, uh, the clients are supposed to start the sync on the latest finalized block. And, you know, as the finalized frontier moves, they have to also retarget their sync to this block. So basically, this, this, this state needs to be available in the peer to peer network in order to be downloadable. So this is why we recommend here that basically the clients should keep this state available in their persistent store. And it is argued that basically like, since most ETH1 clients are now moving to the model where they really only store one entire copy of the state and then a bunch of additional information to facilitate reorgs in some way, then basically we, we argue here that it is the best to simply store this state of the state of this particular block because it is you know like it's the easiest to handle and um we also described that basically like in order to facilitate the reorg processing uh, it is recommended to then like keep other information in the main memory instead of the persistent storage because it just makes the reorgs a little bit easier and um finally we get into this part that should probably have way more text um, so, and it's kind of a bit of a controversial topic also. No, no, it's not the issue section yet. No, for now, we're still talking about the reorgs. So we have the, um, we have this thing with the manual intervention reorg. So basically, um, <laughs> the issue is as follows. So, uh, in the, in the, uh, current Ethereum one main network, what the, there is an assumption in, in the client especially in Geth, like this is where we are coming from here. So that basically there's got to be the safety net for uh, handling issues that uh, arise in the, you know, live network. And for example, if there is a consensus failure in the, in the network and we just had one, so it's kind of, you know, a really good example, then it's kind of good if there is a little bit of a time window where reorgs are still possible and in the geth this time window is defined to be 90,000 blocks long so at the moment it is basically always possible like the geth will always ensure that it has the possibility to perform a 90,000 block reorg and the reason for this is not so much that like during the normal operation these reorgs will happen all the time generally it is not expected that there will be a 90,000 block reorg but the, the specific case where this is really really important is if your client version, for example, had a had an issue in its processing because in this case, it will not be able to follow up on the new chain until you have installed the software update, for example. And uh, because of this, it, you got to have, you know, like a bit of a time window to actually update your client. And when you do so, it needs to be able to actually, uh, you know, like reorganize back, even if the wrong chain has also advanced by a significant number of blocks. And this did happen even with this, you know, like if with, the, with the most recent consensus failure that actually because uh, some of the pools were still mining on the like uh, chain that had the, that had the, uh, that had the bug in it. It's kind of that basically, you know, like if, if we wouldn't be able to reorg out of such a situation, then you wouldn't really like you would have to resync basically, which will take even longer. So it's kind of a good idea to be able to have the safety net. And we would really like to have this. And in order to provide it efficiently, what we recommend here is that um, the execution layer clients should maintain backward diffs of the state in some kind of persistent store. So basically it should be able for them to reorg below the latest finalized block, even if it is a rare occurrence, but um, it gives you the safety net to be able to say like, you know, if there was a problem, you can, you can kind of reorg out of this problem by then applying these reverse diffs to your persistent state until you reach the common ancestor of the two chains. And from this point onwards, you can then process forward to get to the good state. 
So this is kind of, we, we, we feel pretty strongly about this and we would really like to recommend this. And as we will see just now, it is also probably gonna be required to do something like this. So now we get to the issues. So the main problem uh, that we discuss right away is that actually everything that I just said is you know like totally uh, wrong because um, finalization doesn't work in this in the way that we in the get team you know initially understood it. So it's kind of we were not aware that actually in the ETH2 uh, consensus finalization is something that can you know take up to two weeks in the worst case. So what this means for us is that um, our current scheme uh, of, you know, like persisting the finalized block will actually like this. We cannot just use the latest finalized block as the point where we store the state, because then we would have to keep up to two weeks worth of state on top of this in some other store. And uh, we feel like this is too much. So um, we haven't, uh, we have basically been thinking about solutions last couple of days, how to really do it. So, um, and what we find is that basically, probably we're going to have to adapt the sync a little bit to add this the notion of the calcified block, which will usually be the finalized block, but it may also be an unfinalized block. And adding this calcified block will have a lot of implications on the sync because, uh, yeah, like it basically makes the whole thing a lot more complicated. And I really invite you to like, you know, uh, look with us through these issues in the in the upcoming weeks and figure out. Uh, how we can solve it in the in the best way. Um, we will find a solution for this, but yeah, for now, basically, we would really like the sync to work in the way that is described in the rest of the document. But unfortunately, because the finalization can take so long, it it kind of like yeah means we have to uh, do some more engineering to really figure it out. So we have reached the end of the presentation now. If anyone would like to ask some questions, I'm really happy to answer like everything now. Yeah, thanks, Felix. I have a question first. Uh, how much space do you think those dips for these two weeks uh, will take? Uh, like you mean the, the reverse dips? Um, yeah. We don't really know about this. So this is generally something that I, I, that we need to discuss. Um, so the problem with the reverse diffs is that it's, I'm actually not sure it, it might be that Aragon, maybe someone from Aragon is here and can comment, you know, like how they handle the reorgs. I think they might have something like this already implemented. Uh, hi, it's Andrew from Aragon. Yeah, we have a reverse deltas. So we can re implement reorgs by implying reverse deltas. Yeah. So the question is just, you know, like, what's the, what's the usual size? I mean, I guess it's the same size as the forward, you know, approximately. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I don't know off the top of my head, like Peter would know, but I don't know what is the usual size of the diff of each block. It, it's, um, it's, it, it, it's, I think it's manageable. The question, like, I mean, it's definitely going to take some disk space. I don't really know, like, what's your window in Aragon for these diffs at the moment? Well, it's configurable. We even have uh, the mode, like in the archive node, we don't yeah. prune anything. So we have uh, deltas for the entire history of the mainnet, and it mm -hmm. takes um, roughly one and a half terabytes to like yeah. for a full archive node. Mm -hmm. With pruning, it's configurable. We can configure it for something like 90K blocks as well. Uh, yeah. And then the Total database size will be about half a ter half a terabyte, but I don't know off the top of my head how much of that is um, the deltas, the the changes. Well, that's 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 pretty good information. It kind of matches my expectations as well. So okay, yeah. So th there you have it. So I think it is it is manageable to like if, if you know Aragon actually has it already implemented like this, then we can definitely say that like this is a this is a manageable approach with the reverse diffs. It does mean that the reorgs below uh, below this point where we where we keep the like main state, they will take a lot longer to apply because you have to basically you know like adapt the state incrementally for each block. You can't really skip. I mean, you could store larger deltas, but then that would take even more space. Yeah, I will okay. mute when I'm not speaking. So, yeah. Um. Yeah, thanks. Uh, the other comment that I uh, have is uh, regarding this uh, period of non-finality. 
Um, so what could probably be used is the, um, like if the consensus client uh, communicate the uh, like finalized, uh, the most recent finalized uh, checkpoint, the most recent finalized block and the, the most recent epoch, uh, the most recent, uh, the block at the most recent epoch boundary, each time this boundary happens, it could be used to um, like, to handle this kind of, um, uh, this kind of non-finality periods uh, if they are too long. So the execution client may uh, see these two checkpoints and decide what is the um, like distance between them. Um, and uh, I think it makes sense for the, this uh, cal calcified block conception uh, to use the blocks and the epoch uh, boundaries um, at some follow distance uh, from the head. So this is just, just basic, basic thought, thoughts on that. Yeah. Uh, also, we could, we could use justification stuff, justify checkpoints, but I assume that if we have no finality, uh, then we potentially don't have the justified blocks, but uh, it could be also used. So if, if there is, uh, if the justified checkpoints is much, is much closer to the most recent tip of boundary, it could be also used as a pivot, pivot block. Um, yeah so yeah. the details there are like interesting but also like for us it's more like the main thing that we want to achieve is basically like we need to have some kind of threshold uh, defined it doesn't have to be very smart about the threshold but the main problem is just it needs to it needs to uh, basically not be further than like you know a couple hundred blocks from the head so anything that satisfies that is good enough. And I suspect that we're going to have to calculate this on both sides. Uh, so I think it would be easier to just make it like a very simple definition. So in my definition, I just put, you know, like it's the finalized block or it's uh, some block, which is, uh, you know, five, 12 blocks away. If the finalized block is older than that. So just basically just puts a bound on that. And uh, either way, this, the change to the calcified block will have huge implications because um, it basically requires that during the sync reorgs need to be need to be handled. You know, like in 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 some way, there are some cases where reorg is not possible during the sync due to constraints on the state. So it it, it we will have to think a lot about these cases and also um, the, the, the in general, it's kind of like a bit messy because we're gonna end up in a situation where like since the calcified block may not be final it can happen that even during the normal operation, we will have to invoke this like emergency reorg procedure, which will take quite a while. Uh, it's still, and then basically we will also have to put like really hard uh, requirements on the clients to be able to satisfy any reorg between the finalized block and the calcified block. And uh, obviously how they implement it is kind of, you know, up to them, but it would be good to have a recommendation that actually works. And uh, for now, what I know is that not all clients are able to have such reorg. Um, the, it, 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 it puts some, like, for example, in the case of Aragon, it's like, yeah, it's configurable, but it will no longer be configurable in this, in, in, you know, for, for anything after the merge, because you will have to provide a certain number of these tips. So you basically have to restrict the user freedom there because otherwise their client will not be able to follow the chain correctly should the situation happen and things like that. So it, 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 I think it has big implications on the clients, the, this like uh, adding the calcified block. We were certainly not prepared for it when we were discussing the sync initially. We were kind of thinking that we're going to get off really easy with this, you know, like finalized block, but it seems like it's not, not, not so easy. Right. right. So I see, the, I see the value, I see the like practical engineering need for handling state in these times of non-finality and having things that do not go to the depth of finality. Um, I do note that in the event that you didn't have finality and in the event there's some sort of attack scenario network partition, that if reorgs beyond the calcified state are very expensive, then all of a sudden that actually becomes like a place to attack. Um, if you can get the chain to flip between states that are beyond the calcified state, then you've now like grinded most clients to a, to a halt, uh, trying to do that expensive reorg operation yeah. from disk. Uh, so there's, I know there's like very much practical engineering considerations here, but there's also probably security considerations that need to be uh, discussed in tandem. 
Yeah, I would I would also like to note that basically like my, my first reaction was that, you know, like we should rather change the ETH2 to basically make the finalization a bit more reliable. But I already heard it from like multiple people that unfortunately it's not going to be possible to change ETH2 for this. So uh, we're going to have to, I guess, find the... Yeah, that would be some, like a two-year project. Other solution. Well, this is a fundamental um, consensus property that you can't have that. Um, well, sorry, but maybe if you like have some slot finality, you could you could be in a different mode, I suppose. But as long as the chain can well, grow but if you want an available ledger, then you have you don't yeah. have another choice. Um, no, I get it. Maybe I mean, one comment there's... on that is though maybe one one possibility to what uh, Danny just said would be to make reorgs beyond the calcified block uh, manual. Because I mean, I reckon when right. you are in that mode. You would probably still say, yeah, sure, reorg said large can happen, but there's a high probability that it is actually an attack if that happen if that does happen. So you might actually want user intervention to pick pick the pick the fork in that case. And it could even yeah, yeah well we could Felix we could definitely I, specify it like this. Yeah. Felix and I discussed that maybe uh, when you do trigger that type of reorg, the execution client responds and says that's really expensive are you sure and then that can either be triggered from annual intervention or the beacon node even trying to get better information before it triggered such an expensive reorg so there's maybe there's a lot of different like trade-offs on that spectrum there's also like i mean a question like when you say really expensive does that mean seconds minutes hours i mean that yeah, that makes know. a big difference there so right again it's something i mean if it's depends. It depends yeah. on the on the on the implementation of the state, and it implement it. It, it depends on, uh, on on you know like, I mean, uh, I, again, since basically only Aragon has this exact system implemented right now, so it was kind of you know like the way I wrote it was kind of inspired by how I think their their stuff is working. It seems like mostly works like that. It's kind of that basically. Uh, I think. They, they might be able to give some context, you know, how long it actually takes to like reorg, for example, 10,000 10, blocks. I don't know uh, how, how long it would it be takes. great to get those numbers. It's just, a, it's, but it, again, it's not really going to be a, a guarantee because it, it high, it's highly dependent on the actual, um, on the client implementation, how it is able to do this processing, you know, like what's going on in the client at the time. We cannot really say, I think it's definitely not going to be on the order of seconds because reorganizing many blocks in this way basically just means like a ton of, of, of rights to the disk. And yeah, I mean, you can always cache some things and optimize some things. And it might be that we eventually get to the point where this stuff is actually kind of, you know, like fast, but we can't really say for sure. I would just basically really like to assume for now that it's an expensive operation because if it would be so quick, we wouldn't, yeah, like, I don't know. We, we have to see. I, I'm just and, careful. We can probably so generalize that uh, rewinding n blocks is similar in time as going forward n blocks. So if like a block is processing in 100 milliseconds, that's probably your rough estimations. But, those no, but it's, not a, it's not the same, right? You only need to write the diff. You don't actually need yeah, yeah, to. Yeah, it's not like it's because not in executing a block, you you always need to read and then write depending on what you just read. Um, whereas this one, you would already know exactly everything you have to write. So I don't know what disks implement, but I can imagine that that could be a lot faster. But it's, yeah, it's, it's definitely done. there's no EVM processing involved. Right? Not just talking about the EVM processing. I'm also saying there are no round trips involved. Like you, you could tell the disk, "Here's yeah. everything you have to write. Do it." And applying a reorg the next forward thing. usually would include diffs that were in memory, whereas applying the reorg backwards is going to be reading from from disk. And so I think that's one of the main time considerations based off of instead of doing reorgs past the calcified, yeah, which would be yeah, for sure, in memory. And in the worst case, we'll have to, like, in the worst case, uh, I mean, uh, like, we have this nine ninety thousand blocks, and we'll have to re-execute them, like, from the last latest finalized uh, checkpoint. So it just it depends on the uh, time of the execution, but yeah, it's just a few hours to my. Yeah. So, Marius, there also has a good point in the chat. 
um, so basically we also we already have this kind of optimization implemented in the get as well and it's definitely applicable here so like if you need to do like you know a basically really large backward movement on the state it's also possible to minimize the number of writes because you can just combine multiple diffs into one uh, in, in, into one uh, in the memory before writing anything and doing this usually saves quite a bit of time because there is this, this the state has kind of high turnover so you may be able to skip quite a few operations if you just basically uh, instead of writing out every single block backwards you can basically skip over some and hope that you know the diffs kind of cancel each other out it's usually the case so it's like something something else to keep in mind i don't think we have to discuss the details about this too much if anyone has like more high level questions i think the scheme is pretty easy to understand uh, i don't think there's a lot of new information here but if anyone has something then we i can answer it so i want to i want to just say, have one comment i think that as we consider this design that it's important to consider it to uh, so we don't, we're not writing uh, like a very ad hoc uh, communication protocol between consensus and execution for this particular sync and instead we're writing something that generically provides uh, the adequate information to support underlying sync methods so that we don't like design this too pigeoned to the particular thing that we're dealing with. Um, and I, I have some ideas for that. And I think that generally what you've written can be adopted to that. Uh, but I just, I think that's a good design goal. Yeah, so for, for now, I will keep this, like the operations that are being used there, I will try to keep it a bit abstract because I think it's gonna be really easy for us to later uh, change it to the like, you know, like map these onto the like uh, sure, sure. real operations. And you guys have a lot of good ideas. I already uh, check out, you know, like the, the, the API design document. It is, you know, like there's a lot of information available uh, fr from the ETH2 node that can be used also during the sync. And uh, for sure, we will have to make use of it when we redesign it for this calcified block. For example, we will likely need, you know, like some notion of like what's the current head of the chain and things like that. So uh, we will yeah, work it I, in. And I, I think like sending all procs during the thing as well as finality instead of just sending finalized information. You know, yeah. Kind of yeah. Cool. Um, Any further questions? Yeah, I think we're kind of at time for this just because we have a few more things on the agenda and only 10 minutes. Um, I guess we can continue discussions about this obviously in Discord and um, yeah, I perhaps on the merge call next week. Um, I'm not sure if, I'm kind of thinking maybe Mikhail's doc will take the full hour, but I'm not sure if maybe doing like half the consensus API and half this makes more sense. I don't think we're going to have super big updates for it like next week. It, it, this okay. Is, I, I, yeah, I don't think it makes sense to discuss it, you know, like over and over for now, because basically okay. it's just a matter of me updating it for this like idea with the calcified block, which I will do at some point next week. So, yeah. Okay. So no rush then. It's valuable oh. for Aragon, who I think generally relies on different sync uh, protocols, full sync and these rewinds and things uh, to think about how they're going to be doing it in this context and see what what overlap and what differences their requirements need. Right. Yep. Yeah, yeah um, I, I would I would really like you know some more feedback from especially from the ETH one client author. So this is kind of written. I mean, like we have written it from the like Geth perspective. We know we can implement it like this in the Geth. But, you know, like how it's going to be for everyone else, I don't really know. And this is specifically about this later section, which is about the reorg processing and the state availability. Like this stuff really touches, you know, on the core aspects of the client. And we hope it's something that can be uh, implemented by everyone in some way. But we have to like, this. I think it's more a matter of, you know, like agreeing among the ETH1 clients, how we're going to do this. And uh, so it's important yeah for you guys to, to basically check it and and think if it makes sense for you or cool yeah so yeah let's definitely discuss it in two weeks uh once yeah different uh client teams have had time to, to have a look and you've you've made the updates felix um but yeah thanks a lot for sharing this was pretty valuable and um the last kind of big thing we had on the agenda which uh Apologies, we'll probably have to do a bit 
quicker and we can also discuss again at a future call is uh, EIP 3756, uh, the gas limit cap. Um, light client, you've put this together. Do you want to maybe take a minute or two to give the context and, and high level overview behind it? Sure, I can keep it pretty short as well. So setting some sort of in protocol limit for the gas limit has been something that people have wanted to do for a while. It was originally part of 1559 and then removed. And then in March of this year, there was the IP 3382 that proposed to hard code the gas limit. And I think that 3382 failed for, uh, uh, you know, the main reason it failed was because it didn't allow miners to reduce the gas limit in the case of some sort of attack on the network. And, you know, building on top of that EIP, the next, um, the next plausible solution would be to just have a upper bound of the gas limit. And that's what 3756 three, is. It caps the gas limit at a in protocol defined amount, and it allows for miners to still lower the gas limit in the case of some sort of um, attack on the network. And the main reason that you want to cap the gas limit is that right now block proposers have full control over what the gas limit is. And this allows them to, to bypass the EIP process and all court devs process and in making decisions about the protocol that, that could negatively affect the decentralization and security of it. Right, and one bit of context I think I would add is when we had uh, the discussion around, uh, I forget the number, but the previous EIP, the cap, the gas limit, uh, one of the arguments against that was kind of backwards looking, saying, you know, miners have historically always been uh, aligned and, and you know, like they've done a good job. So it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to remove this, this, uh, this degree of freedom from them. Um, and, and I think over the past, couple of months we've seen like you know there can be external incentives like tokens and whatnot that that pop up to game this um especially as block space on ethereum becomes more and more valuable um so yeah i i, I think the the kind of reasoning that we had around like well miners have always been good in the past um might not hold forever like looking forward basically if there's more and more incentives for people to uh, to try and influence that process. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'm curious what people's general thoughts are on this. Uh, feel free, oh, a couple hands up. Uh, Alex Vlasov, I think you were first. Um, yeah, well, my questions are more like for consistency of this EAP, which was proposed in a very short form without any, any estimates on uh, what is the number of state grows, what is actually the, the factor which potentially affects the security of the network most. Like, um, I couldn't find any different questions in, any, in anyone's work, any blog post or whatever. Like, is it indeed that uh, latency of the disk access is a stopping, is like, a, is a point which, uh, which is like, is the most vulnerable point in processing the new block. Uh, like uh, what is the state growth rate? What is what can, can be called acceptable state growth rate? Uh, and then like what's the state growth rate per clients? Because as I was quite surprised to hear in the merge call, well, I mean, I cannot make a good contribution there, but still very interesting for me uh, that it's now was kind of implied that the clients would behave in some way regarding how they store the data. And um, like, it means that uh, it's break, it's like in the future, all the clients will behave in a similar way and potentially it will bring uh, everyone's state down to the size of, of what the Aegon has at the moment, which I believe is the smallest one. Um, so like in this current form, I, it, it was very hard for me to react to this in, in any form. So I would just ask to extend it and uh, it would also affect obviously the number of the current limit, uh, but I, I'm just curious in more consistency. Maybe it's just not in the EP yet, but there is already some analysis. Would be great to see it. Right, thanks. Um, yeah, I'll just get to the other comment. Or like, client, do you want to 
Uh, I was just going to say briefly, like, you know, we can in, in, add more to the EIP. I think there's a lot of uh, benchmarks that have been done generally, and um, we can we can add more things to it. It was just something uh, to propose the idea quickly. Um, cool. And yeah, just because we're, we're almost at time, uh, there's three more comments. And I think we'll take those and, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, I think it was Ansgar, Andrew and Marius. So Ansgar, you want to go first? Sure. So uh, I only have like a specifically brief question. Um, as you're saying, right, like that the the uh, the motivation here would be to just make sure as blog space becomes more and more valuable that like miners basically don't succumb to the <laughs> temptation at some point to like uh, like to to um, abuse the control there. But the the situation is just that right now we plan on the next hard fork with any features to be the merge, at which point there won't be minus anymore. So I'm just wondering, is this still a concern uh, like for proof of stake? Uh, and if, if not, if this is really mostly about minus, do we plan on in case we end up with like a December Ice Age fork and a, I don't know, um, January February merge or something, would we consider this EIP to basically be included in the Ice Age fork? Because otherwise it seems to me to not like, like this would be right. the only circumstance. I would, would still definitely be say this. that this mechanism is right for abuse for any set of actors that can control it. Um, and I'm not, I'm not claiming one way or the other on, on this. I don't really want to get in there, but it is still contextually. Uh, in, if there's an issue with miners, it's an issue with stakers. And if there are mechanisms that can be designed to incentivize the miners to do certain things, that same exact mechanism can be used on stakers. Yeah, and, and regarding the uh, including an Ice Age fork, the way it's written, it could also be included as a soft fork before the Ice Age. Right. Cool. Um, Andrew? Uh, right. Uh, so um, I think uh, the weak uh, consensus in the Aragon team is that we are against this this change but we are not going to die uh, on this hill uh, personally i think it's bad for two reasons first it, if it requires a hot fog then it will distract us from the merge and uh, second is that currently the fees are very high on ethereum so if uh, the gas if uh, the miners or the validators raise the gas limit reasonably then it puts some pressure on clients to like perform, maybe make some architectural changes to keep up. And I think it's a good thing. Thanks for sharing. And uh, Marius, I think you had a comment also. Yeah, I think that's, uh, I would just like to react to that. I think that's a bad argument that um, we would force uh, current clients to change the architecture by increasing the gas limits i think uh, all current clients are looking into increasing uh, uh, into changing the architecture in uh, in similar ways as Aragon does um, so the people are uh, already looking at it putting pressure on the teams is just not going to increase uh, the the speed in which uh, this is going to be implemented um, the other the other small comment i have that it's currently, in my opinion, it's not about uh, state growth with the current uh, uh, gas limit. It's about DOS. Um, I'm not sure if all of you are aware, uh, aware but uh, aware, but like there are some DOS vectors. We found some DOS vectors uh, recently, um, and um, it's pretty hard to uh, measure this. And so. Uh, yeah, I don't think this 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 parameter is extremely dangerous, and it should not be uh, in the hands of people that are not familiar with what's really going on on the network. Um. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Uh. Yeah. Just because we're already past time, you know, we can obviously continue this conversation on on Discord and bring it up on a, on a future call. Uh, I think we have kind of some, you know, definitely areas to look at. Um. I think Pooja, you had put a couple EIPs on the agenda, uh, EIP 24, 2364 and 2464, which are basically the ETH64 and ETH65 protocol, EAPS, uh, 
as I understand it, the issue is like both of those are shipped, but the EIPs are still like in draft, right? Right. So the main issue here is uh, EIP 2481, which is for ETH 66. That is uh, in the last call. Actually, the last call duration has also passed, and we would want to move that to the final status. But uh, the problem is that proposal requires ETH 65, which is 2464, and ETH 65 requires ETH 64, which is 2364. And uh, both these proposals are still in draft status. So we would want that these two uh, proposals should move to the final before we could move EIP 2481 to the final status. I'm happy to make the pull request to uh, request a status change. It's just that we wanted to make sure that it is in knowledge of GET team. If anyone from GET team wants to volunteer and do that, fair enough. And if not, then uh, we can uh, uh, do that and uh, we would need just author's approval. So this, thanks for the initiative. What I can say is that I think the last time we tried to do something like this, there was like a huge amount of backlash for some reason, because then people came on and, you know, like wanted to actually see some justification for these EAPs, even though they are like four years old or something. I don't really know. Like, this is definitely something that I would like to avoid. So I feel like these EAPs, they have been, you know, we don't even use E64 anymore. It's already like past, you know, it's, it's it's basically it's already happened like it we, we there is really no reason not to move it to the final because it's not even supported anymore and i mean the mechanism in it is obviously still supported because it's carried over into the newer protocol versions but the protocol version itself has already advanced like beyond it's like already like after its end of life now so i feel like it's like from this point of view moving these eaves to the final is like totally justified and I really just want to avoid getting to the same kind of weird discussions again that we had last time where someone then wanted to like, you know, for formal right. reasons. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So let's just try and like, if I think Peter is the author on both, so he'd have to actually accept the, the change if, if I understand, but like, right. If, right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll make a pull request to move the status from draft to review. That would be the first step. And oh, Peter no. has... Guys, can't you just commit it to the final? I mean, does oh, it, no, have, uh, no, is it really uh, necessary? Like, okay, we uh, have some EIP editors on the call if they have you. I just have pasted a, a, like a link to the earlier pull request, which we created for EIP 2481, where we received some comments from EIP editors mentioning that these two proposals should be moved. So if we can directly make it to the final, happy to do that. I can answer that quickly. Um, I'm not I'm not a fan of skipping straight to final because it encourages people to drag their feet because if you drag your feet long enough, eventually you can just avoid the bureaucracy. And as much as I hate bureaucracy, um, I don't want to create perverse incentives for people to uh, just like not to go through the process knowing that if they wait long enough, they eventually they can avoid it. Um, so that what being said, I want to we avoid is basically do, like, putting in, in review. So ca can we... What was that? Please... Uh, can, can yeah. we try to avoid putting it in the review? I mean, it's okay if they move to the last call or something, but they like the review. Seriously, this is it's inappropriate because what is possibly going to happen? We just put it to the last call and then maybe even wait if you if you if we have to. I don't know. It's a special let's, case. With let's talk about, let's talk about this in Discord uh, only because I suspect ninety percent of the people who remain on this call probably don't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, and la okay, so last thing, uh, that was it in terms of, of content, but uh, next Friday, same time as all core devs, uh, 1400 UTC, we're gonna have another call to discuss uh, wallet support and infrastructure support for 1559. Um, yeah, so if uh, you are kind of an application or wallet or just generally interested in, in kind of broad adoption for EIP 1559, uh, you can join that. Uh, we'll post the link in Alcor Dev, and there's an issue on the Ethereum slash PM repo um, for it. And yeah, that's pretty much all we have. Um, thanks, everybody. I appreciate uh, you staying real, real quick. Past the end. Oh, yeah. La last thing if you are an application developer, um, please update your Web3.js oh, version thanks. into the yes. latest. It looks like it may be causing some issues with MetaMask, it's supplying some different uh, priority fees, which are incorrect. So just make sure to update to the latest version. Thanks. Right. Yeah. If, if it is a pre-1559 pre 
Web3.js version, it doesn't return a 1559 transaction. So that means you get the gas price to set to both the max fee and max priority fee. And um, that basically causes overpayment for, for some users. Um, thanks for, for reminding Trent. Cool. Well, yeah, thanks a lot to everybody. Um, see you all in two weeks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.